Welcome everybody to Tree Exact Show. I'm here with Brian Ellie, uh, our friend the jerk's back. He hasn't been with us for like, I don't know, five or six months. He just became a father. So before we get going, well, congratulations, Matt. All right. Thank, thank you, you for thank joining you. us. Thank you for joining us. Our special guest today, I'm very excited about this one. I think it's fitting because we just did a cartoon theme song. We have a worker for Disney for about you know 30 years, animator. He created, wrote, produced Darkwing Duck. He he produced some of the Chippendale. We'll get into everything he did. I don't want to blow it up on the spot here. We have the one, the only Tad Stones. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. This is Glad awesome. To be here. Yes. Oh no, we are thrilled to have you. Before we get into you know your history and stuff and how you got into animation, I want to run through a thing with you, and I want to see if I have your approval, if that's okay. Okay. Sure. So recently, I did an Instagram live top fifteen countdown of cartoon theme songs. Okay, and this is just fitting that you're on the show here. I want to run down the top five and see if you approve of them. This is of all time. Sadly. No offense, the Darkwing Duck one got an honorable mention. I did like the show, but it just, I know, I know, I know. I just, <laughs> this interview's I just, over. <laughs> yeah, right? You, why, why would you? He just, he just flew to Moscow. I'm transparent. <laughs> what the music? Have you heard the theme song? I, that's what my, that's what our yeah. one, that's what, it was like Daffy Duck or that's, something? That's what our friend Nick, who's on the <laughs> that, network. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, was the saxophone too hot for you? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly yeah. He prefers baritone sax, not alto. Hey, I just, I'm yeah. transparent as possible. I wanted you to hear it from me before somebody dug it up down the line. So, <laughs> no. I already watched it. So, <laughs> I know. All right. So I basically, have number Chip and saved your ass, basically. Yeah. Did you really watch it? Yeah. Oh wow. Oh wow. Appreciate it. How do you? <laughs> what'd you like it? Was I a little charismatic or a little? Not at all. You were like a dead fish. <laughs> 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 like, <laughs> hey, so know, I couldn't tell where the smell was coming from, but yeah. All right. So Ducktales was number one. Oh, I hope you're okay with that, but yeah, that's it. Fine. We'll move on then. All right. So Todd, let's get. It. That was awesome. Tad, let's get let's get into it. Uh, tell us about your history, how you got into animation, where you grew up, and stuff like that. Before you, we get into the shows that you worked on, I was. I'll try to do the fast version. I was literally born across the street from Walt Disney Studios at St. Joe's Hospital. Um, so maybe it was destiny. Um, anyway, I uh, wanted to be in animation or comic books or cartooning. I grew up with a bunch of of how to cartoon books that my dad had because he had wanted to be a, a cartoon artist and had a lot of courses and things like that. But uh, he graduated college like at the depression. So it was like, you get the job that's out there, you know? Um, anyway, I, uh, so I, that's what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do, either, you know, animation. I, my dad worked at carnation company and because of the carnation Disneyland, uh, uh, partnership where they have restaurants there and all that. Uh, I was at Disneyland like once a year for the company picnic, which was, I always tell this is like, this is obviously when it was first built, um, where Pirates of the Caribbean is right now in Anaheim used to be a park, like a mowed lawn picnic tables park. And that's where they would set up the company picnic. And uh, they had a big tent up and the golden horseshoe review and Wally Bogue was famous or doing the shows there. And he came out and did a show in the tent and then they played bingo. And it was like, I was a little kid. So it all seemed normal. Now I go bingo. Disneyland is right there. It's, <laughs> it's like, it's like, like 20 yards away. That's di right there. And Oh, sure. B11. Bingo. <laughs> yeah. So that was weird, but still it got me into the Disney feeling, I just felt like part of it. And they had an art of animation exhibit where uh, we bought the art of animation book by Bob Thomas, which a lot of the guys who came in around me uh, all had grown up with, which really took you through how an animated feature was made. It was all about Sleeping Beauty. Anyway, about I'm getting in the high, I'm in a high school and I'd like to be in animation, but I felt like the only place worth working was Disney because they were the only ones doing full animation. I mean, Hanna Barbera was in town, and you know, I went to school with kids who'd raid their trash cans and come up with all these, you know, Fred Flintstone's jets and classic cells. Um, 
but I wanted to do, you know, I appreciate the full animation. And my feeling was Disney's the only place to work and they have all their guys. So that's not it. I talked about, you know, I was there at the early days of Marvel comics. I said, man, comic books, I don't do that. And um, anyway, it turned out the sweet mate of my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, was the daughter of uh, Exitensio, who is a famous uh, layout man, worked with Ward Kimball a lot, um, and then went over to Imagineering, which then was known as Webb. Uh, anyway, his daughter said, "You looking at some of my art, because I was only an art major like one year, and then all my English teachers wanted me to move to English for my writing, and I ended up with a major called Humanities, because it sounded like I could do both, and I ended up not taking any more drawing courses. I ended up like 3D ceramics and metalwork and jewelry and stuff like that. And I never even got one writing course because it conflicted with my teacher assistant duties in ceramics. Uh, so that was weird. But <laughs> she was looking at my stuff and she said, you ought to apply to the Disney training program. Mm -hmm. They have a training program? <laughs> you know? And she says, yeah, uh, you should call Donald Duckwall. And not a hard name to... Uh, remember so uh i called for information he assumed i was calling for an appointment and said yeah next thursday we'll come and look at your portfolio so i hang up it's like yeah now all i need is a portfolio because i hadn't been an art major for three years uh luckily the ceramics teacher who i was a the ta for um was taking over the art department while the head of the art department was on sabbatical and he loved Disney. He actually did the goofy yell. And uh, he made sure I got into like life drawing class and things like that so I could quickly do sketches and stuff like that. Um, I showed my stuff. They liked it. They said, we really need more quick sketches and all that. And over the weekend, I like, um, this is before tape. This is back in the mid-70s. Uh, I watched like basketball games. I'm not a sports guy, but I watched any sports that was on that weekend and tried doing quick sketches of it and cheated by the guys down the hall who had all the sports illustrated magazines and copied cool poses out of that, took it in and they really liked it. We went for the review board, which was basically what was known as the nine old men that of Walt that started the studio, not exactly, but a big chunk of them and a few others, uh, they liked not only the life of the drawings and feeling of movement they had, but the fact that I had done so much in a short amount of time, which is pretty much definition of a 2D animator's job. Uh, anyway, you go from doing personal to, and I came in like, I want to say five months, maybe six months after Ron Clemens. You might know from Ron and John Musker and Clemens who've done, you know, Little Mermaid, Aladdin, all the way through Moana. Um, anyway, I came right after him and about three months before Glenn Keane. So that was like the group I was with. Um, anyway, right after the, the test that I survived, uh, you, then you become an in-betweener. And I almost got fired because I was so bad at in-betweening. It was just like, it wasn't computed. Um, I ended up, I won't go through all the details, but... Uh, I ended up moving, uh, into, I got to assistant animator, I got one scene in The Rescuers, the original, uh, moved into story and did an educational film for Disney. They weren't sure what to do with me and uh, they sent me over to Imagineering and said we're doing this thing called Epcot Center and uh, I got to work in the same like 8 by 12 room with Ward Kimball for like nine months while we worked on this world of motion uh, audio animatronic ride and god if there was any time in my life that i wish i had a journal where i wrote down you know all the stuff you know uh, that happened during the day it would have been then but you know i had a, my oldest son was like one or two at that time and it's like i had better things to do than writing a diary uh anyway then i worked with uh i worked on a space pavilion that never happened but i got to meet george lucas and uh, talk to him. Uh, I was the only one in the room who was, who was not too cool for the room to say, I'm sorry, all my friends in animation would kill me if I don't ask you about Star Wars. And he happened to be sitting across from me. And we just, he told me there were nine films. He tried to deny that for a while. Really? And, wow. and he said, everyone's going to hate the first three. Now, <laughs> well, yeah, now well, I look yeah, back and that's that one right out of the park. 
What year? Yeah, was exactly. This when you said this? God, I know it would have been. I want to say. 79 or 80 so it, been, it would have been like a year before or two before wow. epcot opened so whatever wow. that would have been um yeah well he when he said no one would like it it's because he said it was a political there were political films now it is kind of like they're your films if you don't think people are going to like them you, you don't have to write them that way you know um so self-fulfilling prophecy maybe um Anyway, I got to meet him. And then the last part there, I worked on the Imagination Pavilion in its original form with Dreamfinder and Figment with Tony Baxter, who was like, you know, one of the top designers at Disneyland and, and uh, Epcot. Um, went back. I was supposed to do documentaries based on those things. That got me back to the studio. And then I ended up doing, um, again, they were looking at where to put me because I had had paid rate pay raises so that when I went back to feature animation, it was like, we can't afford you. And it wasn't like I was making that much, but they didn't have a slot to put me in. It wasn't like, oh, we've been waiting for you to come back to put you in charge of story or something. No. Um, but luckily, some guys over at licensing had some special projects they wanted to develop. One was Sport Goofy, which became Soccer Mania. And the other was that I pitched was Mickey and the Space Pirates. And these are going to be half hour specials because they felt back then Disney turned out a, f a animated feature like once every five years. Cause the department, when I got there was only like 55 people, 50 to 65 people, not counting ink and paint, a tiny, tiny group making this movies. Uh, you know, compare that to the rolling credits at the end of, you know, any of the animated films. Uh, anyway, the, they were impressed that in the time they thought I'd just come up with some log lines or ideas. I presented, you know, concept storyboards that told the story and full of artwork and, and all of that. And that stuck in their minds because they felt like if movies only come out every five years, we can't do much to merchandise. We have to be on TV. So this, the idea of these half hour specials was their way of, of maybe making that happen. Flash forward to when the world changed and Michael Eisner and Frank Wells came in, and Jeffrey Katzenberg. Um, and the first Sunday of his first week, uh, I, got, I got a call before that. I was on vacation, actually. And someone said, um, we know you're on vacation, but would you mind coming to Michael Eisner's house this Sunday? Like, oh, I've been reading the papers. So it's like, yeah, I, I think I made time. Uh, anyway, that was the first, that was the reason why I was invited. It was some of those licensing people uh, and merchandising the head of Gary Chrysler, who went on to really build the animation division in TV. Um, those are the guys who I worked with doing those Mickey and the Space Pirates sport goofy thing. And they had remembered me as this creative guy. So I was there at the first meeting. Um, and Eisner's feeling was just Disney should be the top name in animation. It doesn't mean feature animation and TV animation have to look the same, but we should be the best in TV and the best in features and the best in Sesame street, short subjects, whatever, you know? Um, anyway, that got me in with that group. Um, and then about, I want to say eight months later, I was thinking of leaving the company because I had been going to science fiction conventions because of my work on the space pavilion, the Epcot future stuff. And I just felt like I want to do something creative and I'm just spinning my wheels here. Um, because I wasn't in features. I was just, I was helping out in live action as an advisor. And, you know, it was like, there was about a year and a half where really Disney should have gotten rid of me. <laughs> it was like, really? You're giving me a paycheck again? What? Um, every, just like last week. Okay, fine. Um, anyway, uh, and I have to mention that my thought was, you know, if I could freelance storyboarding, I could like write short stories or write prose, science fiction or fantasy, you know, feed my creative soul or whatever. Uh, and the guy, Michael Webster, who was head of the department at the time, said, oh, you don't want to do that. Why don't you come over and visit us? 
And it was like, you know, said the spider to the fly because he took me over to TV and he started introducing, yeah, Ted may be coming over here. I'm, really? I thought I was just getting a tour. Um, anyway, ended up at TV, technically in management as, as creative manager. Uh, we had gong shows. If you're yeah, yeah. too young, know what a gong show is. It's the old TV show where you had like 30 seconds to be entertaining or they gong and yank you off. And, uh, Eisner and Katzenberg would hold those. There was one yeah. early on when they came to features and they just go around the table and you say a line and it's either like, Oh, that's interesting. Or they talk about it and then they go or gong next. And, uh, I actually at that meeting, that. I was, pardon me. No, we still have that. If you think about it, the voice, oh, yeah. all those things, that whole, the same model. That's true. It's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, anyway, I was sitting next to Ron Clemens and Ron tried to pitch the little mermaid. And they stopped him and they said, you, you guys just did that. It's called Splash. It was a great movie. It's fantastic. And Ron, who's naturally kind of a, a, he's a great leader, but he's like a quiet guy, was trying to say this was something different. And uh, they were just saying, no, just you guys did it. We can't do it again in animation. Uh, they ran out of time before they got all around the table like a second time. So they just said, turn in whatever you got. And Ron turned in his Little Mermaid thing. When they saw that write-up, they realized, oh, wait, this is a... I mean, it was completely different from what right. you ended up right. seeing, but it was like they knew that was a completely different thing. Anyway, at TV, I was, uh, we had gong shows, and they actually said I was not doing what technically I was hired to do, which is, again, I was dealing from ignorance. Ignorance was my friend in my career, <laughs> strangely enough. Um, I should have been calling agents and saying, what writers do you have? Or we're looking for original ideas for them to pitch and, you know, go through that. I just, I didn't know anybody. I'd always been inside this in my entire career. Um, so anyway, we had a gong show where I think we pitched 22, 23 ideas. And I think, uh, I want to say seven of them or something like that were Jim Magon's. Um, and who was like a second, one of the creative leads with Derek Chrysler when he came over from the record company. Uh, and then like one was outside of that and the rest were all mine. And they actually said, you're supposed to be working with writers. And I just looked at the calendar and said, yeah, that's nice. Except that the gong show is coming up in this many days. Uh, and they were, you just, you know, they were like, the only one I remember is like, uh, the Trojan birds and legionnaire cats. And the idea was think of the city of Troy up in trees, giant trees. And then the cats, it'd be like Rotor and coyote. We're constantly trying to, you know, attack the city for the birds. Uh, thank God they didn't go for that idea. Cause I have no clue how you would make a series out of that. But um, anyway, in the second season of, or after the second season of gummy bears, NBC wanted to make a change. Jim Megan created the show with Art Patello. And uh, Jim, prior to that, had no experience in TV or script writing or anything like that. Disney just said, no, this is our guy. If you want our show, here's our guy. Um, but then they were feeling it wasn't like they were number one because they were pitted against the Wuzzles, another Disney show. Um, anyway, they said, Ted, we want you to take over. So it was like, okay, fine. And that got me back to the creative side. Uh, so I story editor on third season of Gummy Bears. And at the end, they made me co-producer. And I said, if I knew I was co-producer, I'd give different notes, you know. But even then, I looked over our storyboards and things like that. Uh, and then after that, I created, uh, actually with Jim, uh, created the concept of Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. Or actually, we created the idea of Rescue Rangers, had a different lead character, and it was Michael Eisner when we were talking about, they liked the show, they didn't like the lead character. Uh, and while we were discussing other classic Disney characters that maybe we could turn into shows as we did with DuckTales, as soon as Chip and Dale were mentioned, it was Michael Eisner who said, with those chipmunks in that show, and it was like sold. Did, and we went on from you, there. Did you base Chip and Dale, because that's one of my favorite cartoons growing up, did you base it on, like, because a lot of cartoons might be based on actual sitcoms or old shows, did you base the two characters on, like, I don't know, uh, like a certain TV show you grew up watching? 
No, I mean, as a joke, we used to say Indiana Jones and, and Thomas Magnum P.I. Right, or Magnum P.I. Be the because of the shirt. Yeah, just because the sure. red wine shirt. That was more of a gag once you saw the color model of the shirt. Um, no, actually, that started as a, uh, I think it was Ken Kuntz and David Weimers were a writing team who had worked on The Wuzzles, which was, I think, Disney's first show, and then Gummy Bears, right, overlapping it. But they pitched a show. Eisner and Katzenberg loved trick titles. Or like their, their feeling was you have to deliver a quality show. But if you have a catchy title, that may get you a bigger audience to see your better show, you know, and then you have to keep them. Uh, anyway, Ken and Dave pitched Miami Mice. That was when Miami Vice was huge. Right. And they loved that. So when in production, we quickly changed the name to Metro Mice. We even got a script. Carl Gears, who went on to do Winnie the Pooh, um, Jim Megan and I, we wrote the script uh, and uh, created the character of Fat Cat as the villain. But it was really just a mouse police station. And the problem with that, it actually held guns. I'm going, like, what were we thinking? <laughs> um, but it was kind of like, wait a minute, if you're in a police station, you're really limited with the kind of stories you can tell because they're always, you got to kind of cut out all the violent things that you normally see in cop shows. Mm -hmm. uh, and that leaves a lot of bank heists and jewelry stores. And, you know, how do you do that with animal characters? Uh, and that's when we rethought it to be this rescue rangers group, just kind of a more general, you know, the cases that fall through the cracks, uh, similar to the rescue aid society, although we weren't directly thinking of that, um, from the rescuers, uh, Anyway, as soon as Chip and Dale, you know, again, we, so we pitched that. That's how it came about. And then Chip and Dale meant, okay, we have two leads instead of one. Uh, Gadget, Monterey Jack was slightly different character. He was a kangaroo rat. Zipper was still there. And then other characters dropped away because it's like you have to keep the size of the team small because you're always going to have somebody in trouble and a villain and you just have too many bodies to be animating in a 22 minute story. Um, so that was, that's how rescue Rangers came about. All right. Uh, I'll pass it. Brian, you got anything? Did you always have the ability to draw? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Because I was this just is thinking thing. that. Yeah. My brother, my brother is also, uh, he does video game animation. So he works on like the call of duty games. He lives out in San Diego uh -huh. Growing up, I mean, stick figures, like sloppiest handwriting in the world. And then he said, you know what? I, like after high school, he was originally going to go to Penn State to be an engineer, changed his mind. It was like, I want to go out to California. I want to, uh, I think he went to the Arts Institute in San Diego. And he's like, I want to work on video games. And he, he but he needed to learn how to draw. And he pretty much like he went from like i said stick figures to the or the work that he does now is phenomenal then like i can't believe it so like did you always have that ability were you born with it or did you kind well, of like work on it i i gotta say and i learned this from this was the mantra of an of the famous artist cartoonist course that my dad had these books that i grew up with um the slogan was always to learn to draw by drawing, which is pretty much true. And most people just don't try. They say, oh, I can't draw a straight line. Well, you know, you don't have to use that many straight lines if you draw. If you just keep drawing every day, if you tried to draw something, you know, after a few months, you're going to be way better than you did. So I just was drawing all the time. We had all these art books, specific cartooning books, a lot of comic books of my own. Um, and you know, so I, and the, probably the biggest deal was my dad worked in, uh, like I say, a carnation company in like, the advertising area and they would do promotions of, uh, this is Frisky's dog food. Um, and, uh, they would, when they have a promotion, they would put out stationery. It's like, Oh, there was one that was, they gave away an Indian headdress. Um, you know, a stereotypical war bonnet and that was just this thing to hype i don't know i don't know if you sent in dog can labels or whatever um 
anyway, they would have all the stationery that they would send out their publicity releases. And at the end of the campaign, there'd be all this paper and it was like heavy duty quality bond paper and you turned it over and it's pure white. So I had access to a lot of paper, mm -hmm. which spoiled me. I just could draw. And I talked with Ron Clemens about it. And Ron had a you know, single parent, uh, his mom, every once he would draw on paper bags, every once in a while, his mom would splurge and buy a package of typing paper. And he'd use every corner of that where, you know, I was this spoiled paper guy. <laughs> it was like, right. I don't like that line. Oh, I'll use a new oh, sheet of paper, you know? Uh, so it is something that you, you work with. Uh, on the other hand, there's jobs in animation, uh, in, even in storyboard, where it's not about being a draftsman. It's about composition and staging and filmmaking kind of thing. Uh, you know, just telling a good story, getting emotion out of a drawing that, you know, wouldn't necessarily look like the end result um, at all. It would be very crude, but it still tells the story. Yeah, uh, I just I just always looked at drawing as kind of like singing, like yeah. you were born with it, you know, like you can teach someone to modify their voice, like to sing properly, like there are methods to do it. But like if you can't sing, like like I can't sing, you're not gonna be able to teach me how to sing, you know, like I was yeah, but, drawing. But as uh, as somebody who sings in a really nice in the shower, if they join a church choir or take music lessons they're going to improve they're going to take their whatever talent they have and get better with it but a lot of drawing is hand-eye coordination i was what i didn't do enough of <laughs> doing it now because i'm trying to teach myself to paint um is drawing from real life and you know i always and it was funny when i meet people say oh i, I can draw from life I, how do you make up stuff and draw it like that's all I did. Uh, but it is that, you know, I should have done more of that because that really improves your drawing overall. But it's kind of a hand-eye coordination. It's just like drawing something and then realizing, well, his nose is kind of a triangle. And then there's this little, there's a little triangle that's a shadow here. And then these are shapes and you stop, you just can break it down into shapes and the negative shapes around my head, for instance, uh, you start piecing that together and compensating and, and kind of, you know, this famous thing where you put out a thumb or, or hold up a pen or something. Well, you're measuring, you're saying like, well, his head's that wide, that tall. And that's about as, oh, that and a half would be the size of his shoulders. And it's, you know, there's a technical side of it too, but the more you do it, the more it starts coming natural. That's so now again, for animation, it really helps if you, are quick about it and yeah. not too precious with any one drawing. Well, yeah. you, gave, you gave me hope that one day I could draw, Tad. <laughs> well, keep yeah. drawing. Yes, you know? yes. L draw L that raccoon. You, you got a raccoon behind you. That's, you know, that's my show shape. logo. That's my show well, logo. There you go. It's a raccoon with like circles under his eyes. It's like an egg. It's an egg shape, a little triangle head, and a, you yeah. know, just start drawing that. You know, I have friends who don't even treat me this good, Tad. Thank you for being positive and believing in me. <laughs> well, I made it. Remember, I called you a smelly fish, I think. You did, beginning. you did. So, you know. But I deserve gonna, it. It's going to be a roller coaster tonight. You know. <laughs> yeah. let's, go, let's go out to Cali. I love saying it because she hates it. El Ellie's out there uh, in the same state as you, so you guys are on the same timeline here, and we're a little ahead. Yeah. So, Ellie, what do you got? Yeah. What did you say? No, Where am on. I? Oh, okay. I was like, uh, California? <laughs> um, okay, so did you work on the Rescuers Down Under at all, by chance? <laughs> no. I worked on the original right. Rescuers, but not the... Okay. I was out of features at that time. So okay. by then, I guess I was... That was during our time at TV Animation. In fact, one of the original pitches of just a show was we can do... Because it was created as a series of books, was can we do a rescuers TV show? And it was Jeffrey Katzberg said, no, because we're going to work on a sequel, you know, movie. Uh, and that was a big deal because there had never been a, a Disney sequel feature film before. <laughs> it was, wow. yeah. Down Under it was, was a different world. Do you know, I feel like Down Under was it? more famous. 
Down Under Pardon was me? fantastic, first of all. Oh, yeah. The animation in Down Under was amazing. And also, Joanna is my favorite from like, the whole oh, series. Yeah. Joanna, she is the best in her fan club. But anyway, so next question. Um, the city that Darkwing Duck is in, um, is that Saint supposed Kinnard. to be... A, yeah, Saint Kinnard. Is that a mixture of... Uh, like New York and San Francisco, because it kind of looks like the Brooklyn Bridge, but then it kind of looks like the Bay Bridge, or the Golden Bay Bridge a little bit. It's exactly. It's a I bunch mean, of cities. Fans always try to determine where it is, and it's like, does the concept of a fictional city totally elude you? <laughs> it <laughs> no, is. Obviously, like, yes. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, again, in the DC comic universe, they made up cities, but, you know, the reason why Batman lives in Gotham and Superman lives in Metropolis. Maybe there's another guy who lives in Big Apple. You know, it's like they were all terms for New York. Uh, but with with St. Bernard, it was uh, a couple of things. I had a Jefferson Airplane poster when I was growing up that had this crazy artwork of a of a of San Francisco that was this crazy hill, just a cartoonish thing, all covered in buildings, and that stuck in my mind. But really, I was just thinking at the beginning of the number of stories we get. And originally, I mean, Darkwing had his plane, the Thunder Quack. The Rat Catcher was his motorcycle, like Judge Dredd. Uh, and then he was supposed to have a boat, too. And I forget whether we actually used it in an episode or not, called the Wave Shredder. Uh, so it's like, okay, I need water around because warehouse district down by the docks is always like a famous place for crooks. Uh, and the chance to use his boat, and, you know, it was just kind of thinking about superhero tropes that kind of did that. But I tend to think of it as, yeah, it's some sort of, I mean, it's, I think of it as a fictitious city, but it is definitely, there's a lot of San Francisco in it just in terms of that bridge. Um, and I think it was Mike Peraza who came up with the idea of putting his, uh, headquarters in the bridge because he had drawn these great towers. And it's kind of like, well, here's the place. Uh, so it was, it was that, so it is that vibe. I mean, you need the big city vibe. Uh, right. You know, it, it, sometimes it's just the practicalities yeah. of that. It's like Spider-Man sure. kind of has to be in New York because if he lives yeah. in Kansas, he's got nothing to shoot his webs at. He can't nobody, do a lot nobody, of swinging, nobody, you know? Yeah, nobody wants so. to see Darkwing Duck in Des Moines, Iowa. It's just right. not. It's Never. just not good. Oh, there's a lot of Iowans who like that. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no offense to the people in yeah. the mind. It just wouldn't work. Yeah. The same. Uh, there sure. goes your viewership in the oh, yeah. Midwest. Lost yeah. Thanks. I, I lost yeah, the field. I'll, I'll I stick. lost the field of dreams. It's over for me. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, Speaking, yeah, hold on. The, Speaking of Darkwing Duck, though, are you involved with uh, the reboot that's rumored? Ooh, can you even tell us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, come no, on. You were holding on to George <laughs> Lucas had nine films for 20 years. <laughs> Give us a little <laughs> this, this man is a vault, obviously, <laughs> yeah. so we're probably not going to get anything. I can say nothing. <laughs> yeah, all right, that's fair. Uh, I will say this. Other than I know its existence, I know no details of that. Everybody assumes <laughs> like, oh, he must Life. know about the, yeah. the Chip and Dale movie. I'm, no. <laughs> No, it's, it's not like I mean, Disney runs this past me, you know. Yeah, I'm just yeah there's a Chip and Dale live action animation movie in the works. Wow. Okay. Yeah. We'll take it as it is. Before we get the crone in here to ask questions, I have to wonder. You worked on the storyboard. I'm going to, a lot of kids my age are a little upset. You worked on the storyboard of Fox and the Hound, correct? Yeah. Are you responsible the for the that. saddest death of all time at the end? Or in the beginning? Like, are you responsible for that? We just need no. to know. <laughs> I did, uh, and again, that was back, sadly for me, before you had those credits that went on forever. And uh, I worked on Fox and Hound under Wooly Reitherman, who was, you know, one, again, one of the nine old men. He did several of those features in between Jungle Book and, um, well, and Fox and Hound, actually. Uh, so I did all my work for him. I did like the hunter setting out traps with copper and then helping out in a few other sequences. That's the one that I always think of. Um, and then I was, that's when I went over to Imagineering and I remember I was called back to the studio in the manager's office. He was like breaking the news to me that, well, you're not going to get credit 
Uh, and I was prepared for that because, again, there was like five cards of credits. It was like you made a whole <laughs> thing about how you had to earn credit. And story was always up to the directors. Well, now the directors had changed. I didn't do any work for them. And I was fine with that until I found out they gave credit to Squeaks, the worm, as himself. <laughs> so they gave a credit to a sound effect. But and especially when the manager was talking to me, he says, oh, I love that sequence where they're setting the traps. I said, yeah, I, I did that. You know? <laughs> uh, and the fact that I didn't make a stink about it in a weird way, he says, I'm going to talk to him again. Like, if I complained, I wouldn't have a chance. The fact that I was kind of submitting to defeat. Cool about <laughs> yeah, it. Was like that, so. All right. Well, anyway. you know what? We can't blame you for that then. Cronin, yeah. go on. I mean, I, I mean, ultimately, television was a better fit for me because – instead of working on one story for five years or, or whatever, although, again, it's working with creative people, so I mean, we still would have enjoyed it. But the idea of, no, I've got, in Darkwing's case, 91 stories I get to do, and we get to shoot out all ideas. I'm working with a bunch of people, and they're coming up with different ideas, you know, and, and all the characters you get to work on. Uh, the only thing is, is how fast we had to do it back then. The new DuckTales crew, I, sh I found a script schedule and sent it to them. And, the, and Frank Angonis, the co-producer and, and head of story, he said, I'm going to pin this on the wall. And when they come whining to me, I'll show it. Because we had to turn out a script one week and then two scripts the second week and then one script the third week and then two and then one like that, mm. as opposed to, you know, DuckTales when I first met some of the guys, one of the writers came up to me and said, how big was your writer's room? I went, writer's room? I said, yeah. guys came in, yelled ideas at me. I yelled back and we came up with something. And that was a story. Uh, even, even for TV and while they were doing tiny tunes, we were amazed that they had the possibility they could throw out finished scripts. And that was not something we could do. We were like, that script had to get done. It's like, you know, that could be better. Yeah, it sure could. <laughs> <laughs> but it's got to go in production. You know? right. We didn't try to fix it in post, but we tried to fix it in storyboard, you know, as much as we could. Crony, go on. Sorry. Before I ask my question, I'm just looking at the, the cast for Fox and the Hound. You got Mickey Rooney, Kurt Russell, and Corey Feldman. That's a pretty solid cast. Oh, and Yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize like the, who was who all the voice was. You're forgetting right. squeak. You're forgetting Ron, squeak the worm. Squeak <laughs> yeah. the worm. Um, Ron, Ron Clemens to get as I showed my second personal test, the second one of my training program. Ron showed his test that he had done in his spare time. That's how you got ahead, and he did Cruella Deville, and it was without exaggeration good enough that it could have been on Hunterwind Dalmatians. It was, mm. it blew the review board away about how good it, now Mark Davis, who did Cruella, was not part of the review board. So when he, they showed it to him, he goes, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> it's like, it's freaking great. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Anyway, Ron, on Fox and Hound, immediately Frank Thomas scooped him up for Ron to work with him. Ron did uh, Big Mama with Pearl Bailey. And it just, if he had done if he had been assigned one of the humans, people would talk about what an amazing animator Ron Clemens is. And nobody knows that. They know him as a director and writer of, you know, all these things that turned around the industry of animation. But, uh, you know, he's, he was incredibly talented in animation. What was your process when you're going into these gong shows? So, did you have a whole script pitch? Like, did you have 10 ideas? Okay. Or are you just on the fly? About, ah, what the hell's it, going on? No, no, yeah, you came up with them ahead of time, but it was, the whole point was concept. It wasn't about, oh, it's, it's this, it's the sensitive interplay of characters that will, you know, no, it's got to be, you know, something big. I mean, not to say you couldn't have sensitive interplay of characters, but it is, um, it really was like, a, it's like, yeah, these, imagine cats dressed up like Romans and birds and togas sitting in a tree with a big stone fortress up there and they're going to be pole vaulting. They're going to be firing catapults, and, you know, whatever. Uh, so real cats, I guess. Um, and the guys were smart enough to say, gong, <laughs> move on. So it was just 
that sort of stuff, like Metro Mice. It mm. was like the name itself got them. And one of them said, how do they do it? They, they can't do drugs. He said, it'll be cheese. And that was enough <laughs> because that doesn't sell a show. But it's like, that is a funny idea. Prove to us that it's funny, you know? So then you go home and, and work on it and, and come up with characters and the types of stories and, and things like that. Um, so, I mean, it's not a process. It's just, again, going back to my college days and, and wanting to be a cartoonist, uh, I was a camp counselor for the summer of my freshman year, my sophomore year, uh, where I told stories around the campfire, actually. Uh, but my junior year, I thought, okay, this is my last summer before the real world. Uh, if I'm going to try doing something cartooning, this is the summer to do it. So I basically, eight to five every day, tried to come up with gag cartoons and sell them to magazines because magazines, one, still existed then, and two, some of them ran cartoons. Um, and I got on, I wish I saved them all because I had a bulletin board full of rejection letters. And the closest I came was the Saturday Evening Post held on to one of my cartoons for further consideration. And that was it. The second closest thing I did is... Uh, I did a cartoon in a letter to my then girlfriend um, and it was a, a, a dad and a little kid at Disneyland and the kid was holding onto a balloon and floating in the air and the dad was holding the kid's hand. So it was just, you know, balloon kid dad, just as a little joke thing. And like a few weeks later, I open up a magazine and here's that exact gag, not with the Disneyland element, but it was like, I'm, I'm thinking the right way. Hmm. So what that was doing, I was constantly trying to come up with ideas, most of them really bad, but that's exactly, I burned the right pathways through my brain, I guess. <laughs> so basically what you needed in, in story, because back then we didn't work off scripts. Fox and Hand, you'd have like a, a story clothesline, they would say, you know, just like a brief outline. They say, okay, how did the, fox and the hound meet it's like okay they're gonna be kids and they're gonna to play together well you would brainstorm okay they're gonna play hide and seek or they could be at a swimming hole or they could be mountain climbing or they ride on the backs of eagles or you know whatever i did you try to draw up the ones that are funny and then you show that to the directors the directors and the directing animators and they say eagles no you know, but they go, oh, wait, oh, hide and seek. That makes sense because they're going to hunt each other. Um, yeah, that's a chance to play out things that we can do later on. But we like the swimming hole. Like, that just feels so country and everything. Let's keep that. So then you would take those and try to develop gags out of those. You'd show them again. They'd cut through them again. And then you'd start putting them in order and maybe put in some temp dialogue if you thought it had to be there. And... Um, you know, ultimately, Larry Clemens was the staff writer. He would come in and, and kind of take the dialogue and write a more formal thing of it. So it was a weird way to do a movie, but it kept those movies very, very visual because it all had to work in storyboard. And that's how things, that's how you get story cheats that later on you can pick apart, but in the moment, it still works. Like famously, Raiders of Lost Ark, it's like, if you're seeing, oh, I've got this sequence where he's stuck on the front of a truck and these guys are going to slow down. He's going to get smashed and all that. And it's just like you're seeing it visually. You're just there. Or, or here they are, you know, <clears throat> going through palm trees and all that. And, all oh, right, there's a giant cliff there. And they're going to fall. Well, you know, if you slow down and think of that, you say, one, really, there's a cliff? Where did that come from? Where did they move the Grand Canyon to? Or my favorite is, so here's a guy on the front of your truck and the guys in the front, what, they're trying to catch a plane. The plane's going to wait for them. It's not like a regular airline. So maybe you might, I don't know, stop the truck and shoot the guy. But no, you're going to do this thing where, okay, you slow down. I'm going to speed up. We're gonna, oh, he's going into the car. Oh, okay. <laughs> You don't think of that when you're watching one of the greatest movies of all time. You're just like in it. And that's what building an animated feature that way 
um, got you. You came up with just these random ideas that you might not get. You know, I, if you just try doing it in a script. Now I took that, I like to think, I took that kind of thinking, flash forward, when I'm writing scripts, I'm thinking visually. In fact, when we were doing Darkwing Duck, I would tell the writers to all think, pitch me the comic book cover. Because, again, a lot of Darkwing's based on the Silver Age were goofy, you know, comic book covers of Jimmy Olsen as a giant turtle boy and whatever. Um, it's like, tell me that. And that way, there's always a visual at the center of the concept, you know, you know, a high concept comic book cover, you know, that we're going to build an episode around. Ted, I, I want to touch on the late 80s now when you guys were working on all these Disney shows. Was The Simpsons a threat? Like, did you see them, like, another cartoon or something come in that was a little different, that maybe not was necessarily geared towards exactly children, but children are going towards? Was there any show that you were like, we're, we might be in trouble here, or no? No, because that's, I mean, we love The Simpsons when it came out, but uh, we were in a whole different time slot. I mean, we were... Mm -hmm in either early morning or uh literally the afternoon the disney afternoon and simpsons you know famously went across on the right. cosby show in prime time uh and so there's no competition there and even though sometimes <clears throat> at the worst you know you'd have a boss who'd start giving you notes kind of based on the what the competition was doing that he that they liked and it and uh I know I've heard other people actually were great for Darkwing because even though we started before uh, Tiny Toons, when Tiny Toons came out, it's the slapstick break the fourth wall mm -hmm. stuff, which, you know, Aladdin hadn't been out. So it was a big controversy that Darkwing was going to like talk to camera or anything like that. Um, but because the show that came out turned out to be something we were already doing, it actually worked to our advantage. But uh, generally you didn't worry about competition. You right. sold just the show that you had. Right. Um, I really want to get into the Darkwing Duck loving Kremlin that you mentioned. <laughs> uh, if if uh, if no one else, Ellie, if you got another question, go one on. more time. Go. Um, do you have any sketches you can show us? Just of, like random things that you doodle. Like, can we see some of your work? Uh, recently, I have just uh, like I said, I've been trying to paint. So show us your paintings. You have a sketchbook me? I am I working on that hard to believe. There we go. Oh, wow. There you go. This is so cool. Brian, why can't you draw like that? Yeah, what the fuck, Brian? <laughs> oh, cool. And did those, those look like, did those take you like two seconds, too? I can show you. No. Take you very long, too. <laughs> It'd be great I if he had, really dark, he, had, he had one of Darkwing Duck hanging squeak the worm. Just like, just <laughs> yeah. holds on to that vendetta forever. Uh, anyway, the, uh, no, drawing is not, if there's a reason, one of the joys I had in my career was hiring people way better than me. I always said I knew enough to be dangerous in all fields. Um, so you really see a background artist, but I would learn things too. Like I knew enough about Photoshop and bring it even before I was starting to use it. Um, that I remember one of the Hellboy films, Vic Cook, uh, one of the directors, uh, and look at Vic's credits. You'll see all sorts of things. Uh, he started actually in a storyboard for me on Darkwing. Uh, anyway, he, there was a scene with a werewolf, and it was in a room with a fire. And he said, can we push this? Can we make that sequence red? You kind of using the fire to be the transition. I said, oh, that sounds like a great idea, you know, visually and all that. And we went to the background guy and they had this reddish room. And I said, no, no, no. I said, if you're going to go, push it red. And, the, you know, you're using a slider in Photoshop. And he pushed it a little bit redder. I said, no, push it all the way over. And the guy pushed a little more. I said, no, and this is where I always say I know enough to be dangerous. I got in his chair, and I pushed it all the way over. So everything's, you know, red, high contrast. Everybody went, oh, God, that's not going to work. I said, ah. and then I start pulling it back, pulling it back. We got to a point where people said, oh, that looks really cool. That looks great. I said, okay, look how far you were. And when I set it back to where they were, what they thought was real red was nothing like. It was like no push it to the end mm. and pull it back so you get rid of the you know be dramatic about the stuff so that's 
what I enjoyed working with artists and, and writers, you know, working with them and learning with them or from them and taking it to another show and all that. So that was, you know, really one of the joys. So yeah, I draw, but um, we just finished like several weeks of, of uh, uh, tax work and stuff like that. So it was like, I finally did a, a finished a painting today, which of course has been lost somewhere. <laughs> That's impossible. It was right there. It's, it's it looks a, just like, have you guys seen it? It looks just like this one. But it, okay. Maybe it's a case for Darkwing Duck. Find the missing thing. Maybe. <laughs> or the chipmunks, because, you know, yeah. lost the oh, tracks yeah. and all that. Squeaks all right, this one got me nuts. All right, you guys go on. Go on without me. Brian, <laughs> Brian, when you sit back, when he comes back, ask your question. I'm still here. No, I, Just have ask your question. I have one more. Oh, wait, have you ever okay. done any voice acting? Are you like, is, do we hear you in any of your shows? It used to be, I mean, yes. Um, it was really frowned upon when we were doing it. Like the boss would say, no, you're not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> and then suddenly it became, it became a thing where show creators – did voices on their on their shows and some are really good I mean, gravity falls there's tons of stuff um but i mean we did <laughs> i remember again schoolia mccorkle and myself and a couple of the other writers on aladdin and the prince of thieves i think um we did crowd noises and uh we had a woman there too and it was like aladdin was throwing gold off the carpet or something i was like oh gold from the heavens or whatever uh just crowd noise and we realized that that woman made a lot of good money that day for just being a female voice and it's like we didn't get into that uh i did the voice of hammerhead according to credits which was a goat guy who was in the um pilot of Darkwing, that was somebody else, but then he just appeared in an episode and he just had a Brooklyn kind of voice and I did that. Um, other, so nothing, it wasn't like, uh, oh, I'm gonna do, this character's got an Ed Wynn voice, so I'm gonna go in and do that because everybody has an Ed Wynn kind of, oh, don't let me silly now. Darkwing, I hate you. No, oh, good. Um, so it's, so I guess the here and there, my voice is there, but it's not like, not a well, staple. actually on, on DuckTales, I did do a voice, the new DuckTales. I was the security guard keeping Darkwing out of the, the old Darkwing out of the uh, studio proper. So nice. Brian that was gone. my cameo. Brian, go on. Oh, no, I was going to ask. I wanted to just real quick, because I know that, if I ever met him, I'd have a million questions and I wouldn't know where to start. But what did you ask George Lucas when you met him, Star Wars related? I just, God, what the, I don't know what my opener was. It was just like, we were at a conference room and aside from one other guy, I was the youngest guy there. And I remember the head of the company, Ron Miller, who was uh, Walt's son-in-law. I remember when he saw Star Wars originally, he says, I don't you know, it's okay, but it's like Saturday morning serials, which of course is what inspired them. But he didn't, he didn't viscerally, wasn't wowed by it like the rest of us were. Um, anyway, so they're all on this conference table. I look, I'm literally across from George, and I said what I said before. I said I got to ask you about Star Wars, and I don't remember a specific question other than probably geeking out to begin with, but then I can't, I can't believe I would have said like, where do you get your ideas from? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Things are asked to me. Um, like if that was, so me, I, if, again, if, it was like, yeah. yeah the, the, I mean, the, I don't remember it, but he, like I said, I got a lot of info out of him for not yeah. having asked the question. So, yeah, I'm just saying like, if it was me in that situation, I feel like it would be like a crowded room all trying to get through one door at one time, like all the questions I'd be like, and I would yeah. freeze, and I would just be like, George Lucas. Yeah. Was he, he wasn't <laughs> well, it is. you got to realize, again, everybody else are like Disney veterans and things like yeah. that up and down the table, so I couldn't, like, geek out that much. If I, you know, if a lot of drool escaped and fell on the table, it would look 
would have gone I'm bad gonna, for me after that. No, no, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to offend you at all. But did he predict that Disney would ruin the final three movies? <laughs> he did not. I do not think he uh, thought that that no, uh, he, Disney would be fine with his organization. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Luckily, I'm not a Star Wars. Hey, I'm of a different age. I'm a, the prequels are much worse than the last. Hey, you know what? I, I, enjoyed, I really like the Force Awakens. I enjoyed the Phantom Menace, so it is what it is. Because I'm not a. Oh, it always depends on your age. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not a I, Star Wars guy, so I enjoyed it for what it was. It was good. I'm not one of these like oh, but if blah blah blah, I didn't really yeah. whatever. So let's get into. Yeah. Let's get into the Darkwing dark, Duck, and you've mentioned before we started recording how somehow I'm you not, had Comrade Duck. Yeah, yes, they went. Yeah. Comrade Dark, yeah, Comrade Dark. Comrade Dark, yeah. Dark, Dark, Dark. I was. He went to Russia, and there was an obsession with Dark and Duck. Talk about yeah, that. Yeah, because and that. it's it shocked me because uh, Bubble Comics invited me as their guest to go to their equivalent of the San Diego Comic Con. It's Comic Con Russia, uh, in Moscow, uh, or just outside of Moscow, I guess. Um, and it was one of their biggest yearly conventions. Uh, and I remember talking with the guy and they said, okay, we think you'll do, and I had, you know, I would do bring sketches like you saw before, um, you know, already done. And then I would maybe sketch while I was there. Um, but they said, well, maybe four hours of signing and then four hours of sketches. And it's like, when I have lines at my table, it's like three people because the guy in front is talking a lot. <laughs> so people kind of crowd up behind him. Uh, it's not a big deal. So nothing they were saying, I kept on saying, well, what if I go over to the bubble booth to do the signing of posters or whatever? So it's more of an event for you guys to bring over theirs. And it was finally, they kept on, for some reason they thought the things I was thinking of as normal weren't going to work. And if I said, I said, you know what? You guys are the experts, so I'll do whatever you say. And the guy, like, really, I could tell, even through email, relaxed. And they said, great. Um, here's the deal, <laughs> as Biden would say. Um, when the Iron Curtain fell, the first cartoon shows to be seen in Russia were... I believe DuckTales, Chippendales, Rescue Rangers, Darkwing, um, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I was told later. Um, I don't know if Tailspin got that first thing. Anyway, it was part of this thing called the Disney Club, which ran on Saturdays and Sundays, I was told. Um, they hadn't had cartoon shows before. The only animation had decent writing, they said, but they tended to be, I guess, little miniseries, very basic animation about Russian folktales and things. So the idea of an actual series and all that means and the colorful and this world that they didn't know about that was so different from Russia um, was amazing to them. So every kid of this generation watched those shows. Wow. Every kid. So it was an obsession. They would watch the shows those shows would be taped and sold in kiosks in uh, like market squares. And everybody bought those tapes and watched them over and over and over again. Um, I had a lot, I, Batwoman, <laughs> this great cosplayer, Batwoman swooped in. I had seen her before and thought she'd had a great costume. Swooped in, gave me a box of chocolates and then whoosh, was gone again. And it was like, I, I wanted to thank her, you know. Turns out she got in line, and later on she told me she was in line. She said five hours. I can't believe that. Like four hours to see me. And instead of a single table, they had four tables, three other people working it. All my stuff sold. I had uh, I signed copies of their comics. They took the comic cover I had done, which is over here. A variant uh, Oh, he okay. lost that. Oh no! What? There you go. Oh, there this I know where they are. This is a variant of uh, this, oh, and actually, wow. he's got a he's got a feature film of this kind of spy type of guy, and this guy who um, wears the plague doctor kind of mask. And uh, so I said, 
well, what if I turn them into ducks? And that's what I did. So I signed this. They, they printed these up on great cardboard. Um, and I'd sign and do a little head sketch. Um, well, people were lining. And then I'd take a picture with people. And they, for a while, they tried to get me to just, just don't get up, just sign. I said, one, I need to get up to just flex my back. And I felt like a machine. But I said, it's when I stand up to take a picture. Oh, no, you cut out, Ted. Okay, I thought it was just me. Yeah, Sam, I was like, no, my audio. You cut out, you cut out. Oh, can you hear you're me now? Yeah, you're good. You're good. Back. You're good. Right. back. Uh, I'm back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the, uh, um, gee, if I knew, knew Zoom well enough to share screens or share things, I have some of these images on my desktop. Sad. I'm, I'm with you. I don't Email know, I know the basics. I know the yeah. basics. You, you yes. could give them permission to share. I know the basics. I don't want to mess up this recording if I click mm -hmm. something wrong. And it would be on him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. If I made it real big and held up the mirror. Uh, anyway, so here people standing in, in line for hours. Uh, I'd leave for lunch for a two hour lunch and they wouldn't leave because they didn't want to lose their place. Um, it was, it was mind boggling. And when I came back, I read a letter. I wrote a letter to my crew basically saying, yeah, I got all the cheers and the praise and all that. But I said, what they were loving is all of your work. It's mm -hmm. what we built together. My crew, the writers, the artists, you know, we all contributed to creating this creature. Um, and again, I mean, here's the thing. Uh, at the end of one of the days, a couple of cops came up to the table. I saw them down at the end. Uh, and one guy was like, one of the most handsome men in the world. And his shoulders were out to here. And he had this old wavy hair and all that. He comes up. And I guess he, they said, uh, how long are you going to be here? And the guys got really nervous and saying like, well, it closed at six and we bundle everything up and we'll be out. Not a problem. We'll clean up and everything. And they said, no, 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 no. We, we just want an autograph. And they said, Oh, let's bring you to the front. They said, no, people hate the police enough. <laughs> we don't want to do that. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I wish I had gotten a picture on my phone of the two of them, but that was the thing that proved. Yeah. They're part of the generation that grew up with those shows. And then this blew my mind even more than that because it's like, wow, I got credit for way more <laughs> in that. They said, Tad, to us, Darkwing Duck isn't a parody because they never had superhero comics. Yeah. They never had shows. So the idea of a villain who is a plant villain or an electrical villain, they were going like, Whoa, how do they come up with those ideas? You know, well, I stole them from Batman and Spider Man. <laughs> you know? yeah. uh, so it, it's, it was like, that's amazing. So they just got the heart of the show, uh, which affected people all over the world. I mean, Darkwing and Goslin. And then they certainly get the gag comedy, but the whole science fiction fantasy Twilight Zone kind of twist, that was all brand new to them so it's like well no wonder it, it made such an impact on it but that was that mind. was an incredible weekend it was it was really fantastic that's so. that's, that's really good i would have never awesome. guessed that tad we have a final segment you've been more than generous with your time here we have a final segment we do um it's called gun to your head um we asked two questions each uh cronin will probably bail on this but oh boy wait, you, reach it. you have a real gun there yes okay. Okay. <laughs> horrible. If anyone who's listening is the he has a toy gun, it's not an actual gun. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, uh, it's called Gun to Your Head. We ask two questions each. They're kind of like wordplay involved. Um, you have to answer the questions and pick a winner at the end. Okay. Now, someone on this panel has not won yet. I won't say who, but he or she is really thirsty for a winner. So let's see if he or she can pull this off. We will. Well, I'm gonna say Ellie. Ellie wins because she's got a dog. So no, 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 sorry, no, no, you can't, no, Boom, not, done. No, 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 no,
talking about this. We think we're all going to win this. Like, we have okay. some of our best questions. So there's Oh, a lot quit hyping it up. Let's go. But Brian, go on. <laughs> go. Okay. Would you rather be Superman for a year and die at the end or be a doctor but never be able to go to one? Uh, I guess in a practical world, I'll be the doctor and fix myself. Can't you just see yourself because you're the doctor? I'll just do super yeah. right here. Oh, yeah. right. number two. I'll okay. tell you, here's the classic the classic superhero question is would you rather fly or be invisible? And uh, that's easy for me. I always say fly. And always. people say, no, invisibility. I said, invisibility is a power that will corrupt you. There, that's no true. question about it. Doesn't matter how good a person you are, because what can you do when you're invisible? Yeah, you turn invisible to spy on people, yeah. things that you're not supposed to see, or if people didn't want you to see. Eventually, that power is just going to corrupt you. We're oh, flying. Right. It's like cool. Man go of ahead. reason. Man of reason. Man of reason. <laughs> go on, Brad. All right. All right. Second one. Would you rather have to wear a tux every day for a year or punch a penguin in the face? <laughs> oh, tux! Not gonna hurt my little penguin friends. I have All to. Right. I have to say, right? A little disappointed in you. How? <laughs> and besides, you know, you're gonna I'll, hurt yourself on the beat. I'll, yeah, let, come on. I'll let Ellie finish this up. I'll go next. Um, all right. So, would you rather fight Darkwing Duck or find your way out of a dark hallway full of ducks? <laughs> I'll fight Darkwing Duck just for the laughs. Yeah. All and right. besides, he might. He could drop a safe on me, and I could turn into an accordion. As long as I was in his world, he'd yeah. not mine. So. All right. Would, would you rather be best friends with Howard the Duck or own a duck named Howard who hates your guts? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be friends with Howard. Okay. Fair enough. Ellie, go on. Okay. Would you – oh, I got to pull it up. I wrote it down, too. Okay. So would you rather have to play Angry Birds for one hour every day for the rest of your life or dress up as an angry bird every two months. And I'm talking full costume and you had to be in full character like Daniel Day-Lewis method acting. Like you had to be the angry bird. You can be any one of them, but. I've never own. had to be in a Disneyland costume, but I've talked to many people who have. <laughs> I'll go with playing the angry birds. Because okay. my nose couldn't take the other. All right. That's fair. That's fair. And going? then yeah. I have one more. Okay, you want to dox it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. That's it. I'm, I'm okay. Not. All right. All Kurt, right. You don't have any, right? I didn't. Okay. Kurt was last minute. You had a baby. Yeah, he wins. So I already won. <laughs> no, 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 I won. Uh, uh, all right, Tad, <laughs> your favorite. You said I won. Favorite question. Come on, and you got to be honest here. Ellie, what was your other one? Angry Birds. Oh, two. <laughs> Angry Birds, Angry Birds or... And then I was kind of kidding. Do you want to watch my dog? Just kidding. Oh. That was it. Might not give him back. Um, yeah, that's fine. Tux. I will go with uh, the idea of interacting with animated characters of Darkwing and Howard the Duck. You win, my friend. Yeah, you know, I, 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 like, I was confident about this victory all day. I sent the text on the morning. This is this a, a good We're one. never going to hear, well, hear this really, down now. It's not really official because Eric's not here, so. No, 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 no. no. Also, no, he did say I won first. Like, it's right off the bat, he already said sure. I won. Listen, guys, yeah. there's yeah. sore losers, I, and, there, you know, there's I losing Ellie gracefully, wins. too. Tad I think Ellie <laughs> wins. <laughs> You know, there's more. He already said off the bat. No, you see, this is what happens. It's, true. it's everyone against me. Every time, Ted. No. <laughs> it's, it's part of your personality. Come on. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, your, it's, your, it's your brand. It's you your brand. You can't be the winner. I know. All right, Ted, thank you very much. And Otto much. has a hurt foot, so Aww. he's got to win. Thank you very much. Sympathy card. Oh, yeah, I am oh, absolutely oh, going yeah. to play it. Bitch, Anyways, I totally won this one. Over. I Eric. totally won this one. <laughs> so thank you, Tad. He's gonna edit this part out. Yeah, absolutely. I'm yeah. sure he will. Tad, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, it's been fun. Uh, yeah, thank oh, you so much. Awesome. Thank you.